Hi there, saints of God. This is Lee Posky. Today I'm bringing information to you that'll help you understand how salvation differs from what most of institutional religion offers. Because once you genuinely possess a born-again spirit, you're given a hunger to understand what you have in Christ. And you're going to see that as your discernment grows, institutional religion becomes less and less appealing to you. Because you see just how spiritually blind and counterfeit most of it is. And I'm talking about all versions of religion. No matter if they're ultra-conservative, fundamental, independent Baptists, creedal, reformed Presbyterians, Wesleyan Methodists, the Charismatics and Pentecostals, or the local non-denominational church with the casual laid-back pastor, or the Funplex Motivational Center. No matter what it looks like, the whole gamut of religion in general that claims to be Christian is a fraud. Now, certainly there are exceptions here and there, but the overwhelming majority of them are spiritual traps. They'll rob you from truly understanding and walking in the light of Christ's finished work for his elect. Most churchgoers are not enlightened to this knowledge that I speak of, so they're content playing the game of their social club of religion. But once your eyes have truly been opened to see the meat of the word, the spiritual treasure of God's free grace, you clearly see the weak and beggarly elements of the counterfeit. It is true that a Christian salvation is not completed yet in that we are yet to be glorified, because we haven't died yet. So in that sense, we haven't yet attained to the final prize. The genuine born-again Christians will finish the race set before us, and the posers will fall away. And this has nothing to do with the heretical notion of being saved, as I'm going to explain in a moment. And it's also true that we are in process of spiritual maturity and growth and wisdom as we're trained throughout our lives by the operation of the Holy Ghost. But that process has nothing to do with our sanctification, which I'm also going to explain to you. Now then, I'm going to give you a handful of verses that you need to become intimately acquainted with. This is scripture, which means that it's truth. These verses are your fence that you need to keep around you all the time so that your inner peace is never stolen by religion. Keep this fence around you and guard the interior like a junkyard dog because religious people, they are the ones who are going to try to tear down what Christ has actually done for you, dear saint. This isn't an exhaustive list of firewall verses, but these should be your concrete guard tower that no religious mouthpiece gets past. And by the way, false religion will frequently use corrupt modern Bible versions. So just be aware of their ways. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 9 through 14. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. This is talking about God having taken away, having taken away the old covenant of law and replaced it with the new covenant of grace. Don't ever let anyone put you under any part of the old covenant of law. Not the tithe, not the Sabbath, none of it. See Galatians chapter 3 if you need more clarity. You're not under the tithe at all and you're not obligated to pay for institutional buildings of religion. The church and the Bible frequently met in people's homes and outdoors. Now verse 10, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Did you hear that, dear saint? By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once Sanctified once, not ongoing, not progressive, once. The last two words in that verse, for all, are italicized. They're not in the original manuscripts. We are sanctified by the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once. So what does that mean? That means that God sanctified you, dear saint, once. He set you apart from his common property of humanity when he placed you into Christ you had nothing to do with it, and you don't become more sanctified 
or more holy as you try to corral your unregenerate flesh. You know Hebrews 12, 14, where it says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. That holiness spoken of is the sanctification that comes from being placed into Christ. The book of Hebrews is in large part a sermon to first century Hebrews that they need to turn from their self-righteous works of the law and look to Christ for righteousness and standing with God. What are we told in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 29-31? through 31? We're told this, "...that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption." that, according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And don't ever forget that when that smug religious mouthpiece tries to convince you of his Christ-denying false doctrine known as progressive sanctification. Know what you have in Christ and stand your ground, because I'm telling you, religion is the one that's going to try to take from you what Christ has already given to you. Verse 11, And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes, the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Dear Saint, those animal sacrifices never took away anyone's sins. They were merely a picture of Christ, His sacrifice. The old covenant way of approaching God is done, never to return. So don't let some Hebrew root salesman con you into thinking that they have some deeper knowledge of God. They don't. The Jews at large didn't even recognize the Messiah when he was standing right in front of them. Do you need any more proof than that, that they're spiritually blind? Don't follow false Israel. Verse 12, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Dear Saint, this is a big one. Jesus offered one sacrifice for sins forever, then he sat down. What does that mean? That means that God is finished with the work of sin forgiveness. That means that because God only forgives sin by the blood of Christ, God is not issuing ongoing sin forgiveness to you. Because Jesus sat down, He's not issuing blood continually to grant you forgiveness continually. This is an area where nearly every religious institution denies Christ. Their plea is basically, come to their imaginary altar. Come get new forgiveness from God. Try harder to do right and stay forgiven by God. Or at least ask God to forgive you as you sin. None of which is taught anywhere in the Bible. It's true that an, that an unregenerate sinner, someone who is yet to be saved, someone who is unsaved, they come broken in, in their sin guilt to Christ to receive sin forgiveness, yes. But once you're cleansed in Jesus' blood, he washed away all of your sin for the whole of your life. God doesn't play less pretend or dual forms of forgiveness. Once you're forgiven, you're forgiven of all sin forever. There is no positional and relational forgiveness. False religion makes up stuff like that to keep you in bondage. Jesus' blood accomplished the totality of every elect saint's sin forgiveness, period. Show me a church that teaches that. I'll show you plenty that robs God of his glory, though. And don't let them put 1 John 1, 9 on you either. Be informed. 1 John chapter 1 is speaking to false Christians. People who call God a liar, people who walk in darkness, people who say they have not sinned. It isn't until after chapter 1 that John began speaking to the beloved. Like I've been saying, once you truly understand what you have in Christ, dear saint, you can't help but see how robbing most of religion is. Verse 13, from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Verse 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. There's the big one. For by one offering he hath perfected, that's past tense, forever 
them that are sanctified. There's your eternal security, there's your sanctification, your holiness, there's the whole thing wrapped up in one verse. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Notice that it's by one offering, the offering of Christ, not by his offering plus your offering, but by the solitary offering of Christ, he has perfected you spiritually, eternity, in eternity. Not perfected your unregenerate flesh, but he has perfected that part of you that lives forever. He has perfected that part of you that will stand before God in judgment. He has perfected forever you whom he has sanctified once, which correlates exactly with Matthew 5.48 and 1 John 4.17. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Now I ask you these things, dear saint. Does Jesus, who is God, does Jesus require that someone be perfect to be acceptable to God? Yes, he absolutely does. A good effort to be good won't cut it. God requires that you be nothing short of perfect. Can you do anything to make yourself perfect? No. In a million years of our very best efforts, we don't come anywhere near being God's standard of perfect. So what did God do for you? He made you spiritually perfect, dear saint. For by one offering, he hath, past tense, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. The question is, do you believe? Do you believe that pertaining to what's been done for you? Do you believe that you're spiritually perfect? Is your local church teaching you that? Are they explaining why you need to believe that? The odds are they're not. The odds are you walk away from their meeting with the net impression that you need to try a little harder than you've been doing to really get right with God. You know it's true. And that's how they deny Christ. All the while speaking words of scripture and talk about Christ. Those of you who understand this know exactly what I'm saying. This is why resting in the finished work of Christ is so forcefully preached in Hebrews chapter 4. It's because it's counterintuitive for the natural mind to grasp. The natural mind, the religious mind, naturally thinks that we're accepted by God on the basis of our commitment to Christ and our efforts at morality in Christ's name, when in reality it's just the opposite. We don't have any morality, and our dedication in Christ's name is a joke. Who among us would want our every thought to be broadcast to the world? God knows that we are fallen creatures, so we rigged it so that, so that we would be perfect. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Remember that. Righteousness is by the obedience of one, not two. Read Romans 5.19. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Likewise, Romans 3.22, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Do you believe that? Do you really and truly believe that you're the righteousness of God? The odds are you don't. Otherwise, you'd be exploding in joy over being the righteousness of God. I can't do your homework for you. All I can do is present this information to you. You're going to have to do like I did and immerse yourself into the King James Bible and dig this spiritual treasure out for yourself. That's the only way it's going to mean anything to you. You're going to have to hunger and thirst for righteousness bad enough that you'll labor in the word until your eyes are open. Don't rely on religion or me or anybody to teach you anything. Now, is that religious man teaching you, dear saint, how you're fully forgiven, fully sanctified, and fully righteous right now, not later on in heaven, but right now by the obedience of one? 
Why isn't he teaching you that? And why are you putting up with following anyone who denies what Christ accomplished for his elect? Don't be religion's fool. I point you to Christ. I point you to his finished work. Marvel at the priceless treasure that springs eternal joy in the soul. There's nowhere else to find it. When you see it, you'll intimately know what the prophet Isaiah was talking about when he said this, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. All right, friend. Well, I thank you for sharing some of your valuable time with me. And all glory to the risen Lord Jesus Christ, and no glory to us whatsoever. Bye-bye.